Hey, welcome to our first Q&A right here at Golf Tech headquarters with Brad Skupeka. And uh, we thought we'd take some of your questions that you've asked online and probably try to do this more frequently as well. So um, what'd you do today? I didn't even see you today. Mm, spend some time helping out coaches with club fitting and nice. making sure I know how to help people out. Nice. Hit the ball farther. Did you have a good day? It was a good day. Standard oh, Tuesday, good. right? That's good. Okay. My day was good too. Thanks for asking. I just don't care. Yeah. Seriously? That's that you don't care. That's terrible. We had uh, all the Trackman guys in. Did you see them today? Uh, I did get to see them. Yeah. Sounds like it's working a little bit better Frederick as well and, and doing a nice job. Matt. Yeah, I hit like 50 drivers today. It's more than you've hit all year. I was exhausted <laughs> at altitude. That is ridiculous. So let's ask, ask and answer some questions, and uh, we'll. I just want to do this probably different than things you've seen before where sometimes when we're on Golf Channel, or even when we shoot a lot of things, we don't really get to say the most honest answers and say things more or less the way that we would like to all the time. Uh, some of it, mainly because it just has to be in a shorter window, so there's only so much time to say some, or to answer some of these questions. So, what do you got? What's the first one? Ready for the first one? Sure. Something you know nothing about. Yes, golf. Uh, so, golf in general, right? Yes, correct. Uh, so, ball's curving to the right. Yep. Tell me something I don't already know about a slice. Yes. Yep, this was from somebody on Twitter who asked uh, asked that question. So, it was, uh, I've heard everything about slicing and how I do it. Show me something that's different. So, uh, let's take a look at one thing that you might not know, but it is probably the biggest thing to know if you do slice. So let's start with uh, on the downswing. Forget about the backswing for now. Uh, you've heard all the comments about move your hands in, close the face. All of those are really useful. But uh, on the downswing, where most slicers really make the biggest mistake, wherever you have the butt end of the club, wherever you have your left arm relative to uh, yourself, uh, however high it is into the air. On the way down, the golfers that we see who slice the most have their left arm when it's even to the ground, like I am right here on that uh, side view picture too far away from them, which is programming the swing direction to then move to the left. A lot of good golfers, though, do that exact same thing, and then they accommodate that leftward slicing path uh, that so many people fight by stopping how much they turn so the shaft doesn't move out more, by bending backward more, that lowers the, the club head itself relative to the angle I'm swinging, and then tilt to the right more, which also lowers the shaft. That is a whole host of other problems, but here's what a slicer would look like just to watch one of those. Looks something like this one. And you see how that one starts to the left, curves back to the right. Uh, let's go ahead and take a shot of something else though. So if you wanted to stop slicing, the first thing I would tell someone to do is keep your left arm in or your lead arm in on the way down. So this one I'll just keep much closer to me almost like a normal shot. See how this one started pretty straight, I wasn't too worried about that. And then the massive curve to the left and then typically how much farther those go to. Now let's take a look at those two compared. So here's the swing I just did. Let's go ahead and pop that one up on the side. So this is the slice and this one is the shot I just hit that drew. Scrub through this very quickly on the downswing. Left arm parallel to the ground. Here's the angle of my left arm. And then the shaft at this point in time is running through close to maybe the middle or top of my bicep. What we see from pretty much everyone who does slice on the way down, when their left arm's even to the ground, like here, you can see how the shoulder to the hands is actually further away. And then the shaft is really running through the base of my neck here. That's the beginning of having this picture, which is the most disturbing one, in the direction that the swing is moving at that point in time versus a shot that draws or overdraws and how much straighter the swing path is into the ball in that last frame. Make sense? That makes sense to you, Bradford? I think I understood most of that. You want to say it one more time, though, just to be clear? No, I'm done. Thanks, though. Good question. Okay, I think I have one for you next. Cool. Or what do you got? You can just read it either way. I got it here. So this one is... Benefits of playing a hybrid versus a driving iron, and how does the difference in CG, or the center of location, affect the shape of the shot? Okay, uh, so the benefit's definitely gonna really vary depending on who you are. 
Uh, if we talk about the masses of golfers that tend to slice the ball, then the uh, hybrid is typically going to be a better club for them. So uh, I've got a couple here. This is just a regular iron, but it'll still serve our purposes. Uh, what we typically find with, like, say, your driving iron, it's usually a club that your better players, say, tend to favor because, if anything, if they fight a hook, they fight the draw, um, and they always gravitate towards a driving iron. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what problem do we say better players always tend to complain about when it comes to hybrids? Well, better players and even uh, with PGA Tour players listening to them talk about it, the hybrids and fairway woods draw the most. Yep, and so that whenever they get these, they just tend to draw it even yeah. more, especially if it's a player that already draws the ball. Right. Now, the reason for that is whenever you have a, the driving iron, the center of gravity, or the sweet spot is just a simple way to think of it, like where you'd want to hit it. With the iron and a driving iron, most of the time it's located really pretty close just to the center of the face. We have some cool stuff here. We can actually measure these things. And it's what we've thought for a while, but actually having the ability to measure those has helped mm -hmm. that out. But whenever we measure a lot of these hybrids, uh, we find that the sweet spot of the center of gravity is much more positioned uh, in towards the heel. And that's not a defect or anything with the club, it's what the manufacturers do intentionally. Now what that's going to do, just as if uh, when you hit a drive or anything off center, the golf ball, to make this pretty simple, because of the gear effect, golf ball is going to want to rotate towards that sweet spot. So when you hit it off of the heel, it wants to rotate more towards the center or slice, off the toe is going to want to draw more. Well, whenever you have a club that has a sweet spot or the center of gravity positioned in the heel, even whenever you do hit that right in the middle of the face, it's still like you're almost hitting it off the toe. So that's going to tend to want to make the ball draw. If you're a slicer of the golf ball, it's a great thing for you. It's going to help you hit a pretty straight shot. Mm -hmm. It's probably still going to go pretty high in the air. But if you are a player that already draws the ball, and then you hit this thing solid, it's going to draw even more, be a very problematic shot. That's why you've seen a lot of players, especially on tour, going more towards like that driving iron in the last couple of years uh, especially. Yeah, it's just the center of gravity placement. So, uh, can I borrow this for a yeah. second? So even if you were a good player and you wanted to hit a hybrid and hit it pretty straight, looking at it from how you'd be moving into the ball here, this is actually about where you'd need to hit that shot on the club head to get a pretty straight shot. So it's not that uh, these clubs are something you can't use, especially if you're good, that CG's way in towards the heel of the club, but that's where you need to hit it. So you just have to alter your strike point. I know when I was playing golf, trying to make money playing golf, if I just would have known with a hybrid, a fairway wood, or even my driver, if I, if I could have aimed just slightly more in the heel, like a lot of tour players have already figured out themselves by trial and error, I probably wouldn't have hit as many shots into the left rough as I did and even still try to avoid now. So I'd grab this uh, M6 Rescue. It's probably the most heel bias CG that we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could play this just fine, just with the understanding of where the CG is. So that's why we spent thousands and thousands of dollars getting the same tools that the USGA and RNA have so that we can measure where these are at. Then tell your coaches, and ultimately it relays back down to our students that way. And that's we transfer our information. Yeah, and I have a little better idea too. Rather than even trying to like hit it off the shaft, yeah. uh, I would just move into some different models that actually align well, sure. the CG more towards the middle. Yeah. So just because it's a hybrid doesn't mean it's definitely going to draw. If you're a tailor-made guy, a lot of the clubs in their gapper line do have the CG position more, mm -hmm. um, more in the middle of the face or any brand. Yeah. There are hybrids out there that do have it more in the middle, uh, but that's where, again, a, a club fitter that knows um, where the CGs are, how the different clubs perform can help you out yep. by putting one in your hands that is uh, going to help your ball flight. Yes. That was, pretty good. One? that was pretty good for you. Should I say it all again? Not bad. No, no. I, no one wants to hear you talk about that <laughs> yeah. again. Got your next one? Uh, sure. How is keeping your head down the worst advice in golf? This one came from someone on Facebook. I think they know that this is just like a joke. If I had to tell you one thing that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard about golf, it is that. And maybe I can go ahead and explain that. So let me clear out some of this data and we'll hook ourselves up to some of our motion. So the oldest adage I think I've heard from people asking about golf instruction or your friends who watch you hit shots is that you lifted your head when you hit a bad one, but then unexplicably when you hit the next shot and you don't do anything different, and the shot's better. Your friends tell you, oh, you kept your head down better on that one. None of that really makes sense. So let's take a look at why. So first I've got uh, that shoulder bend number on the front view camera that's up right now. So that's the amount that I can either bend my whole torso forward, like you see I'm reading into the 50s there, 
or backward. It's just measuring this sensor that sits right on the top of my spine. So when I stand pretty much normal, it reads about zero. And then as I swing, that number, as you can see, changes all the time. It's always moving. Well, I would argue that one of the very first things a golfer wants to learn or should try to learn when they play is how the point in time when the shaft is just about even to the ground slightly before that, all the way into the follow through, how you need to actually bend yourself backward, including your shoulder bend. So in here, I'm about 15 to 20 degrees back looking at it from that front view camera. If you don't do that, and meanwhile, every single golfer that we've ever tested does that pattern. They do it at different rates. They don't always do it for as long. You'll see some players on the PGA Tour hit, like Dustin Johnson. He'll move uh, backward as he's hitting the shot. And then ultimately, after the ball's gone and his club is somewhere right or just about uh, even with the ground, parallel to the ground, he'll start to bend forward again. So it's just a different timing, but he's always moving from a forward bend on the way down backward to some degree before going forward again. The players you watch on the PGA Tour and you see their finish every week and it looks something like this, that's typical of what I'm describing as the most back, 10 to 20 degrees back all the way into the follow through. You need to learn that so that you can actually keep the club moving, keep the grip into the club moving, and then also bending backward and raising the shaft has a a real, real advantage that maybe we can go through in more detail another day, but it actually helps you speed the club head up by pulling the grip upward as you hit. A lot of people mistakenly have a problem in here where they keep their head down, stay bent forward as they approach the ball, and then to help the club go upward and speed it up, they actually just pull their arms towards them to do it. Uh, meanwhile, that backward bending and turning yourself and tilting to the right through the ball, like you see the PGA Tour players doing, is best done and fastest done as you extend your shoulders backward and bend yourself backward as you hit. So the old advice of just keep your head down, it's like the, it's the most pathetic way of trying to describe something that you can't explain. People say that when they just don't know what else to say. So not much more to say about that. You reading? You trying to read? Yeah, you did a great job in there. I think everyone uh, you totally, no idea. You everyone even totally right? understood that. Okay. What do you want to talk about next? Uh, here's one. Why are today's iron lofts so strong? I feel as if this is why they are going so far. Yeah, and that's a common um, remark you'll hear from, say, a lot of students if you say go through an iron fitting that's and they're using some old technology and now all of a sudden they hit it. 20, 30 yards farther, uh, they try to tell you that's only because now their seven iron is actually a five iron, yeah. right? And there's mm -hmm. you know, some level of truth to that. We have seen the lofts come uh, stronger in the last uh, probably 10 years, but that's, they're not strong enough to make up that 30 yard difference. Right. Uh, and there's a reason for the strength, so the stronger lofts that is. Uh, so strengthening a loft, they're just going to take it and basically reduce the loft, right? Okay. But the reason for that is if you look at a lot of the newer irons today, um, they're basically built like a driver. So if you were to do a cutaway of this iron, you'll find this back portion of the cavity is actually hollow. So that's going to make the club face really thin. And ultimately what that does is just create more and more ball speed. Um, we've been seeing this in like the max game improvement category for the last couple of years sure. where the lofts have come down, ball speeds have gone up. But now in the last couple of years, they've had this new category of your, um, like your player distance iron. So you get an iron that's pretty compact still, but has a ton of technology, so the ball speeds are really high. Now the reason the lofts have to come down is now your golf ball is moving all of a sudden like upwards of 10 miles an hour faster. Right. So if you had that same loft, you just hit this thing way up into the air. Uh, it might actually even go shorter. Yeah. So the reason for the stronger lofts, it allows you to hit certain flight windows with the particular club you're hitting. Um, while still benefiting from the launch and spin conditions yeah, and so on. Yeah, and I read on the internet or I see it from a coach or something about uh, because the lofts are so strong, that's why you hit the ball so far, and it, it's just laughable. It's yeah. like total misunderstanding why it's they did that. Tiny, tiny portion. If of it, you, for sure. yeah, and if you had the the lofts five degrees weaker, like they might have been mm -hmm. ten years ago, then uh, you'd have an angle that the ball would land that's so obtuse, like fifty-five degrees as yep. opposed to forty-five degrees that you, you'd lose a bunch of distance, like you said, and then the pitching wedge would go so high, it'd be almost useless with any kind of breeze whatsoever. So you couldn't make a club with this sort of tech and not lower the lofts. Yeah, and that's even back just the ball speed conversation where 
when you have like a blade or something with older technology where it's not hollow, your smash factor with like a six or seven iron maybe used to be like 1.35 yeah. uh, on like a good strike. Now we're seeing with some of these new irons, you can get it all the way up to like a 1.45. It's like really close to almost what you can get with a driver. Yeah. So even if you've been fit for irons, you know, even like three, four years ago, uh, there's a good chance some of the newer technology yeah. is still going to outperform what you have in your bag now. It's a cool time right now to either look at buying a driver or a set of irons just for what Brad explained because these are just, the designs are really nice, the look of the drivers is really good this year, and the launch conditions are just awesome out of these things. You should be doing that. Yeah. Anyone who's a serious golfer should really get a club fitting. Doesn't matter who you are, you always yeah. want more yards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another one, so should. Average golfers take golf instruction from TV commentators seriously. This comes from a golf tech coach who, again, may or may not already know my answer here. So <laughs> should average golfers take golf instruction from TV commentators seriously? Uh, as politely as I can answer that, that one is a no. So I've heard, uh, I've heard a lot of uh, TV commentators who are former players. That's really like the avenue to get uh, and uh, the color commentary piece of, of golf is to be a former player, then people uh, ultimately have this, uh, this preconceived notion or this bias that it seems believable that they played golf for a living. They must know exactly how it works. Sound mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> and they tell you a lot of feels that uh, did work for them when you look sure. at their swings may have totally made sense uh, you know, based off their patterns, right. but when you look at what they actually did, it's not yep. even close to what they tell you they did. That for one, but for like hundreds of other reasons too. The first one would be evidence-based practice. So mm -hmm. if you haven't taught more than 10 golfers, more than five lessons a piece, so you, you haven't like actually done it, uh, I am afraid you cannot go on national TV and try to tell someone, oh, this is what you need to do, or this is why Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy are playing so well. Chances are they really don't actually know. It's unfortunate, but I just know that from sitting on the other side of the the TV and watching, and it's always easy to be critical of what you see on TV. Uh, people criticize us from time to time about the things we say, although we try to make it as factual as we can, but we've also had the opportunity of measuring swings, and we know what people actually do. That's the value of looking at those motion measurements that we just saw in there. Measuring swings for years and years and years, we've got millions of swings recorded and all that data to look at. That reveals the answers of what really separates good players and bad. And we're just scratching the surface on that. We can do a whole lot better and we're going to and we're, our tech is changing and moving fast so we can measure more and more. You have that, but it's just that logical fallacy that like uh, these former players who can't play golf anymore at a level that uh, allows them to still be out on the PGA Tour or Senior Tour to uh, believe that they know what they're doing. And I'm gonna say that unless you've measured swings, you've taught golf, you've uh, taken someone who was not very good and made them better, you're not really able to uh, describe and articulate to people why someone is good at the game. And that even goes for like watching YouTube videos. Um, I once heard a, a, a golf, a former golfer who now is a TV commentator say that he's watched more YouTube videos than anyone in the history of the world. And uh, again, he believes that because he's done that, that's made him an expert on golf swings. I would argue that all that's done has made him actually an expert at watching swings on YouTube. And challenge him against some of the people <laughs> in our office too, though. <laughs> right. That would make like, he'd have to rival my grandfather who can't break 120 <laughs> and hasn't played golf in 20 years, but he loves it as a hobby. He's not any more knowledgeable than anyone else. Now, I take that for what it's worth too, though, because there's a huge amount of uh, influence and understanding and information that you gain from being out on the tour, especially if you've ever won. It's a huge amount there, but it doesn't mean that you can then take that information that helped you and actually uh, prescribe that and help people do better. It doesn't mean anything. So that is not the best place to be looking for your advice. However, it's the easiest because if you watch golf on TV, you're gonna end up hearing someone and you can watch even this week at the British Open or whenever you are watching this. You're going to hear a TV commentator abstractly describe a swing in some way. Uh, his balance is beautiful, his tempo is beautiful. That doesn't, those are just buzzwords, and you hear those over and over and over. Just listen for the buzz and the noise that you hear from uh, everyone who's broadcasting on TV. You know my favorite one? No, what's that one? Just action. Action, yes. yes. Something is happening. He's got great action, or look at his hand Could action. Could not be more vague. Knee action, wrist action, those are 
that doesn't mean anything. That's not really helping anyone. So we're trying to help the whole golf world move past that by actually explaining what people do. So in, uh, to summarize everything you just said, uh, the answer was no. No. All right. Great, nice job. Uh, you can take this one. Can new equipment overcome poor technique? Yeah, that's a good question. Overcome might be um, a strong word, but uh, I'd say new equipment can certainly help poor technique. Uh, so we just talk about some of the some of the benefits sure. that the new equipment does have. Um, so one of the cool things that we've measured, especially a lot this year, and then we've actually collected like tons of the older models. And one thing we measure is the MOI, uh, or the moment of inertia. Think of it as how forgiving some of the different clubs are. And what we've done is plotted all these over the years and they've just uh, gotten more and more forgiving. Even if you're just comparing, like say this M6, to uh, say the M1, just from you know, a couple uh, of generations ago. Uh, the MOI on the M6 is so much higher than anything from even just a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that's only going to help any poor technique problems you have. Is it gonna make it easier to find the middle of the club face? Um, maybe, if you go through a new uh, club fitting and you find out that maybe the club length or the club weight, something like that, wasn't quite right, getting a club that is a more manageable length, a better weight for you, can at least help bring more shots to the center of the face. Yeah. And then with the higher moment of inertia, just the more forgiving clubs, uh, we find that then the off-center strikes are then gonna be just more usable as right, well. So, right. you know, is it gonna help you pick up, um, hit 300 yard drives dead straight every time? Probably not, but it can take that drive that maybe would have been in the right trees, maybe now it's in the just in the rough and 20 yards farther, and now you actually have a, shot, a chance of hitting this next shot on the green. Yeah, and even more so though, you, you're, you're saying all the right things, I think, for sure, but uh, a lot of people are playing with clubs that are too long. Yep. The average stock driver is over 45 and a half inches. Uh, the average PGA Tour driver is much shorter than that, maybe an inch shorter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the CG is placed in the wrong spot for most people, for sure. They have the long, wrong loft of the driver. It's not so much the shaft that's really typically wrong for the average guy, other than the length. The length especially, yeah. though. And everyone, I think, who isn't very good at golf or can't hit your driver very well, having something heavier, shorter, more loft, that's typically showing huge, huge results, which is what we're seeing in fitting. So. Mm -hmm. uh, a quarter of the people who come in for a fitting are seeing close to uh, 30 yards of, of distance gain if they see it. So yeah, you can overcome a bad swing to some degree with your equipment. It'll really help you get on a better path, but ultimately if you miss hit every shot or you have a hard time hitting 10 balls and finding the center of the face even once, it's not going to help you with that. Now, a lot of people initially, they're kind of afraid to go into that shorter shaft because they think it's going to yeah, yeah. cost them more distance, but typically we find just the opposite. Um, you know, Maybe that one out of 10 shot that you do in the middle with the longer shaft works out really nice, uh, but what we find is with the shorter shaft typically is you get more shots in the middle of the face, that creates more ball speed, mm -hmm. uh, and that's obviously going to go a long way to help you get it farther and the likelihood that you hit in a spot where you can actually play the next yeah. one as well. Um, the most, it's more predictable The well. most successful fittings we're seeing for distance are actually 44 and a half inch clubs. Think yep. about that one for a second. Uh, next one, you can have this one too. Uh, it's right up your alley. Yep. Why is drive for show, putt for dough a bad mantra? Yeah, that's, uh, well, when you look at the stats of um, the players on tour, as far as uh, who's making the most money, uh, typically the players that have the best strokes gained, uh, mm -hmm. which is taken into account their distance, accuracy as well, but especially their distance piece, uh, they're the ones that are always finishing the highest in the world rankings, the highest um, on the money list, and really just to be on tour, you have to be able to have probably a ball speed of almost like 170 anymore. Yeah, definitely. So the idea of uh, hit it down the fairway each time and try to make a bunch of putts, you know, not to say players on tour don't do that uh, occasionally, but if you look at the tour as a whole, uh, the longest hitters typically are the ones who win the most, like Brooks Kepka would be an awesome example. Um, mm -hmm. One of the longest uh, on tour right now, and he's won, what, how many majors in the last couple of years? Yeah, quite a few. And now let's even just talk about how that pertains to you as well. Uh, what we find a couple of things, the players, like the lowest skill players, the worse you are, uh, you're actually the ones through like a driver fitting that pick up the most distance. And then through some of the different stats out there, uh, the worse you are, you're actually gaining more and more benefit. You have more benefit by hitting it farther. Yeah. So if you go through a fitting or work on your swing, whatever the case is, and learn to hit the ball farther, uh, that just shows a direct correlation to improving your skill level. I was hoping you'd get to that. That's exactly right. One degree straighter, 
there's no reason you can't learn to do straighter farther and yeah. play better that way. But uh, distance is really the king of this whole game to get your handicap down in a hurry. It's yeah. not spending hours and hours on the putting green. You have to uh, hit it straight enough, basically. You want to hit it yeah. far, straight enough to where the next shot you can get it on the green. Yeah. Obviously, hitting it really far and out of bounds isn't helping you. Well, really far or really far on one and topping the next, yeah. and chunking the next driver is. Those that's top not shots useful. usually go really straight, too, that's though. It's not really useful. All right. Yeah, so. Uh, Ready for the next one? Yeah. Uh, why can't networks, so it goes along the lines of the last question sure. uh, that you answered, why can't networks hire actual golf instructors to do the announcing? Yeah, good question. Uh, I forget where this one came from. I think it came from Facebook. Um, why can't networks hire actual golf instructors to do announcing? Okay. So first, the, the guys who produce a bunch of these videos and stuff on Golf Channel, they are awesome people. They do a great job. I also believe, though, that they don't necessarily always know uh, when they're hearing the best advice from a teacher. So they don't always know who's right or who's wrong. They hear lots of stories that way. Also though, they've got, uh, uh, they have to put someone on TV with some sort of uh, personality that will gain people's attention. So even if the words are coming out right, but they're also very, very boring too, then it won't help and so they, they won't be do that entertainer either. first is kind of what it sounds like. a little bit that mm -hmm. way. I won't go so far <laughs> as to say that's exactly it for sure, but they, I don't think they believe that uh, a golf instructor can keep to, can captivate an audience well enough to, to do that. They'd mm -hmm. rather put a player there with that, uh, that false sense of reliability and dependability of seeing them on there, and then someone who's a professional broadcaster who's got tons of experience. No, that's wrong. I guess just the way it is. It'll change here someday. Okay, next question is, uh, why don't 90% of golfers take golf lessons? So I think it's pretty simple, but chime in when you want. So first, uh, all these other activities that where you do have lessons like skiing or tennis, um, as examples, and there are hundreds of other ones, it's possible to get on a pair of skis and go down a hill and you may roll over, fall, hurt yourself, die, run into a tree, die, Kind of get the idea. A little bigger like, risk involved uh, yeah, compared to playing golf. You can really hurt yourself. Meanwhile, someone can grab a golf club and they could still die as well if they don't know how to use that stand in the wrong place. But you could go to the driving range and hit some shots. It's fine. No, there's really no repercussions there. It'll be embarrassing if you don't know what to do, but that's the first step of what's going to happen. So I think it's much easier for golfers to use trial and error for as long as they want and uh, until they get the result that they're they're seeing over and over the patterns, just not something they can even get past, they're gonna keep doing it. Or you can keep doing that, no one's gonna die. Uh, you can't really do that in, in skiing. And then the, the, the skiing lessons tend to be pretty simple. It's either like french fries, so you're gonna go down the hill with your feet straight, or pizza slice, where you're gonna slow yourself down. You sound um, like a professional. Yes, I teach uh, <laughs> skiing all the time, right now, when it's 100 degrees outside. Uh, so. The instruction is even pretty easy, and beyond that, you don't need to know a whole lot more, but there's something in there. Golf is far more complicated to hit that little stupid ball into that net from 10 feet away. It's pretty easy for me, but for someone who's never done it before, there's a lot that actually goes into that, and it's uh, it, the detailed knowledge that you need is pretty tough, just more to it. So first, I'd say you can uh, avoid taking golf lessons if you choose. Second, a lot of people think they're expensive, but relative to the amount of money they spend playing horrible golf or buying a bunch of golf clubs thinking that they're just gonna band-aid their, their life together, going on flea bay and buying something that's a year old to replace their old driver is not helpful either. So I think all of that kind of comes down to until they reach some sort of breaking point of, uh, I'm tired of this, it's terrible, I don't wanna be awful anymore, you just can avoid it. Sound mm, fair? Yeah, I think there's probably just a perception there as well too with golf, the balls sitting still, like this should be pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, compared to say like your tennis example or any other sports where the ball's mm -hmm. moving, I think there's just a perception to um, an outsider yeah. would in theory think that'd be pretty easy. But yeah. Last point to add would probably be a lot of people have friends who have taken golf lessons and didn't see the success that they wanted to. That can be on the student or the teacher too, but that is another rationale for that. So hopefully you don't argue with me too much on that one there, Buck. Uh, one for you, where do I go for a proper ball fitting? Uh, how about golf tech? We yes. can do it here. Let's, uh, let's yes. talk about what that should entail, though. Um, so there's a lot of cool things uh, in the last couple of years you've seen golf balls uh, changing. Mm -hmm. And there's always a question of why that happens. Are they changing with the driver? Is the driver changed because of them? Uh, but we definitely have seen in the last couple of years that golf balls, especially like your tour quality ball, uh, yep. they aren't spinning as much. 
um, kind of to piggyback off of this ball, uh, question as well of like what club should you be fitting your ball to uh, I would typically do that with a player's driver um, reason being with your driver the golf ball is moving the fastest any error that you do make just gets amplified that much more so trying to find a golf ball that best matches your driver because if you're say your backspin rate's just mm -hmm. off a couple hundred um, RPM with your driver that could be you know 10 20 yards uh, versus if it's off that much with like an iron or a wedge and it's not going to help you, but it's not going to be as detrimental as a, as a driver. So yeah. uh, where can you go? Uh, Golf Tech, that's an easy one. And then just what should you be looking for? Uh, making sure that your driver's properly fit first, and then, again, finding the golf ball that best matches your driver yep. and going the rest of the way that's through. That's good. Okay, uh, one more. We've got uh, someone asked a rather elaborate question, I think, on Facebook or Twitter, and it really came down to, uh, I like my golf clubs at C9 for a swing weight. I feel like everyone on the PGA Tour or good players use D5 type of clubs. So does swing weight matter? Should I worry about that? Should I play the D5 clubs even though that's not what I do the best? Um, plus a very simple question that you finished off with there. Of, uh, should you play the D5 even though you don't hit them as good as the C9? Um, absolutely not. Yeah. I would obviously just play with whatever club that you do use the best. There's a lot of different thoughts when it comes to swing weight. You have some builders that will almost have every different iron in your club or every different club in your bag um, a different swing weight. That's just one way of doing it. A lot of tour players do tend to go towards, say, a heavier swing weight. Sure. Um, but I will say there's been a little bit of a trend, especially in driver shafts in the last couple of years, of actually making more of a counterbalanced, say, shaft. So they just redistribute more of the mass towards the uh, butt end of the club by either more materials, some different materials, uh, thicker diameter. So you actually get a somewhat lighter swing weight um, by doing so. And guys on tour are just using what works the best. Yeah. Uh, so to say they're all using D5 which really wouldn't be true. Uh, if you do have a club in your bag that you hit the best and you find the swing weight's different than anything else, uh, I would do my best to try to make everything else in your bag uh, as close to that as you can. Yep, sounds good. Uh, that's probably a good spot to stop. You think that's long enough, Sabrina? It's about 35 minutes. We're probably just cutting it close. We got a few other things we got to do before wrapping up today. So uh, some of the questions we didn't get to cover are why aren't golfers getting better? That was a really good one for sure. That's a long answer. That could be an hour long show itself. What do you think of Matt Wolf's swing? How do you fit someone for wedges? How does understanding forces and torques make someone a better teacher? Does that matter? Is that overrated? Uh, that's another great topic that would be fun to talk about. Um, old school swings versus new ones. Pre-shot routines and what might be best for someone if you slice or you want to have a more inside takeaway. I guess all that we're just going to have to keep covering. So Sounds like you got to tune back in. Sounds about right. So thanks for watching. Uh, comment below or leave us anything you want. But you can find a lot of cool stuff at golftech.com or follow us on the social media channels. Thanks.